Here are your friends in recovery. Hey everybody, welcome to Friends in Recovery Podcast.com. I am Mike Miles, the Podfather. I'm here with my good friend and companion. Jersey Egg guys. In a certain <laughs> way. <laughs> in a business way. In a business way. Nah, we're friends too, Podfather. Come on. Well, we are definitely friends. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Skylar is missing today. Noontime with yeah. Sky is missing. She's um a day Running without Skylar is, uh, you know, kind of gloomy. But I know, I know, you, you got to deal with me today, Podfather. It's all right. I know. Hey, real quick, I want to tell you who's going to be on our show. KJ Foster. She's the um, founder and CEO of Fostering Resilience. Um, we're going to bring her on here in a minute, but we do have to talk about a couple of things, Podfather. Um, I want to talk about the um, the help at Friends Recovery Podcast dot com. That's how you can get a hold of us. Um, and also we're doing the, uh, we can't forget about this, the, the shout outs, the, uh, you know, send us your sobriety dates and your right. name, and we will give you a shout out. It doesn't have to be the, from this month. It could be from any month, you know, any month, any time of the year, just give us, you know, your Ed C, uh, you know, 27 years. And that's the other thing I celebrated 27 years last week, Podfather. I know and, you did. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Did and, you get uh, a, did you get a 27 year medallion? No, my wife usually gets them for me and she okay. will be getting it for me. Oh, and uh, I did not get it. But um, but yeah, that that's kind of what what uh, what was going on last week. So give us your thank you. And look at a KJ putting up the little uh, the balloons or, or the, yeah, the, I'll see the, him, the yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to come on the YouTube to see what she, what she just did. But um, the uh, that's the important part of this Podfather, is that we share our sobriety. We share our experience, strengths and hopes. We share. Um, what worked for us so it can, so it can be passed along um you know to the to, to the rest of the the world when they start getting sober you know um, and the other thing too podfather is our phone number 617-379-1163 that's 617-379-1163 um that's if you want to say hello to us um if you want to call in with your sobriety date that's great also however you want to do it just get it to us so we can let everybody out there in friends and recovery world that um that we're doing this uh and this is usually scholar does all this stuff but um go to our friends book <laughs> our friends and recovery community of support page and uh friend uh, friends and recovery podcast page and like us follow us and all that stuff and there's a new challenge out podfather um i'm going to share a screen with you guys real quick this is the challenge um that we are doing right now if you guys are on youtube you can see this or if you're on facebook live friends in recovery 30-day coin challenge um it's a zooming through recovery coin with bill and bob on the front and uh saying uh, this too shall pass um unity service and recovery and bill and bob have masks on um and if you attend 30 of the friends in recovery virtual meetings we will send you this coin that has to be our meetings podfather you know the meetings right. that we do um right. mm -hmm. And, and you can get a list of them on our Facebook page. You can get a list of all that, um, you know, all over the place. So I have the coin here also. This is the uh, the live coin here, if you guys can see that. It's a pretty good coin, pretty cool coin. So what we do is you, you come on 30 meetings, not 30 days, just 30 meetings. There's two meetings a day, seven days a week, including our alumni, um, our meditation, and our yoga classes that all count. You guys keep track of how many days you have it's on the honor system email stacy b at genesishouse.net all this will be in the show notes and we will send you a coin how cool is that that's awesome right so how so now that i did all skylar's stuff and i did all my stuff Podfather, how you been because wow. <laughs> i am i'm sick and tired of talking right now i'll be honest yeah. with you i've been very busy my business has been uh, my practice has been extremely busy Good. um for some reason I think it has to do with this uh, covert and people staying home. But anyway, help as many people as I can and uh, do the best you can. That's all. That's it. That's all you can do. So, well, Hi. speaking of people who help and do the best that they can is uh, KJ Foster. Um, KJ is the founding uh, is the founder and CEO of Fostering Resiliency, um, family program director of the Beachcomber Family Center. Um, for addiction recovery, best-selling author of the Warrior's Guide to a Successful Sobriety and Fostering Resilient uh, re Resilience, right? Resilience for the Family in Recovery. I'm sorry, it's been one of those days. Um, she's also <laughs> she's she's also um, authored numerous articles and books 
um, in book chapters. Uh, KJ presents locally, nationally, and internationally on the topics of addiction recovery, um, compassion, drug abuse prevention, mindful meditation, shame, and spirituality. KJ earned her PhD in uh, counseling education, is a licensed mental health counselor, certified addiction professional, advanced certified relapse prevention specialist, trauma specialist, and professionally trained in mindfulness meditation and compassion focused therapy. She also has a YouTube channel dedicated to helping individuals and family members providing free education meditation and meetings. Welcome to the show, KJ. How you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's it's always very surreal when I, this is the second time that I've done a podcast where the person has read my entire bio and it always feels very strange to hear all of that because a lot of accomplishments. Almost 13 years ago, July 20th, 2008 is my sobriety date. Oh, congratulations. Uh, the world was a lot different. So it was. <laughs> it is than my world was a lot different <laughs> bet. than it is today. So I'm guessing you didn't have the PhD, you weren't the licensed method, any of that stuff before the uh, July. Uh, no, <laughs> I, had a master, I had a master's degree in mental health, but I wasn't a licensed mental health counselor yet. So I, didn't, I did have that. Got it. Uh, going for me at that point in time. <laughs> I had accomplished that. But everything else um, that you just mentioned came after my Super. sobriety mm-hmm. as a result, as a direct result of yes. my sobriety. Yeah. So, and Podfather, you can attest to that because you have some letters and numbers and yep. things behind your name too, yeah. Podfather. Yep. Yep. My sobriety date is um, <laughs> October 17th, 1986. Wow. And that was moons ago. And I, yeah, I've accomplished a little bit since then. Mm-hmm. Um, with, without sobriety, there might be some letters, but there'd be no, uh, <laughs> may not Meaning. even be, probably wouldn't be here, you know? Yeah. So I, I think that one of the, the most beautiful things about sobriety, at least my recovery, has been the ability to really um, be able to be the best version of myself possible and, and to accomplish these things that I never uh, thought I could possibly accomplish prior to my recovery. Mm. Also help, you know, when you help people um, the best you can, you know, you don't always get the thank you notes or the, you know, the accolades and that's fine. But when you do see a success story uh, and uh, somebody you know, let you know that you're part of this success story. That to me is like a bag of gold, you know? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Right? KJ, tell me. I'm sorry, you certainly have, co- you've certainly accomplished quite a bit and uh, your bio is really, um, it, it speaks volumes about all your hard work and yeah, dying, yeah. dying to hear you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. KJ, talk a little bit about what it was like before, just a quick little, you know, like your use and, and what brought you to this place, what, like where you're at today. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I would be just, mm, just, I would describe it and probably be um, classified as a high bottom. Um, I always your cat I've, jumping on your desk. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we love cats. <laughs> so, I, um, I, my experience was that I never missed a day of work. I've always had a very strong work ethic, which is probably, um, directly related to how I've been able to accomplish what I've been able to accomplish. So I'm a hard worker. And so I never missed a day of work. I, I spent many, many years as a social drinker. And I, um, you know, I look back now with that different uh, lens and I can see how I drank alcoholically in a lot of circumstances. So it was in the making, you know, it definitely was there. I have it in my family. There's a lot of, you know, contributing factors, but it wasn't until I experienced a um, a, a trauma in my life. I was married for a long, long time, uh, together with my ex-husband for 22 years. He was the first one to experience, um, an addiction in our family and our relationship ended as a direct result of that. Codependency was my first addiction, trying to control mm. his addiction, his behavior. And then, um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, I started to develop my own issue with alcohol 
post that relationship, post the mm -hmm. divorce, through that experience. And my son at the time, uh, we had two sons together. My older son and I sort of dealt with the situation in the same way. And we were on this parallel path to coping with life through drinking and mm. with him, it was um, drinking and his drug use. So then as his addiction progressed, my codependency became worse. And as a result of that, if you know, you know, which I'm sure the both of you do about codependency and the progressive symptoms of codependency, I turned to alcohol more and more and more to deal okay. with the mm. insanity of the situation and wound up becoming addicted myself. And it wasn't until I um, experienced uh, getting arrested for a DUI, that that is what uh, brought me to a place of um, that was my bottom, I guess, at least it put me in a position to get help for myself in spite of myself, if that makes sense. Like, sure. you know, I got sober in spite of myself. <laughs> right, right. I'll show you, you. <laughs> I, know. I, was, I was, I was just put in a position where it, you know, all the things had to happen in just the right way for me to have experienced what I experienced. Sure, I, sure. I made the, I think the one, the one decision that I made that really changed everything was when I had a blower put in my car, I was on probation for nine months mm -hmm. and I decided, I made the decision, you know what, I, I, I'm having trouble stopping on my own. I'm going to go and participate in 12 step recovery because I know that I can't do this by myself. I need support, I need other people, I need accountability. And I decided since I'm going to be on probation for nine months and um, I have this blower in my car, I'm just going to commit to stopping for nine months. And in those nine months, I'm going to dedicate myself to doing the program 100% and just giving it my all. And as a result of doing that and make, with the with the intention that when the nine months were up, yeah. I was back to sure. living sure. my Square life, yeah. drinking, yeah. doing, yeah. you know, yeah. going back to my old <laughs> life, so to mm -hmm. speak, right? Mm -hmm. And as I got better, my son got worse. Mm. And when I was nine months sober and I was off probation and they took the blower out of my car, my son was at the worst he had ever been. Mm. And, I, and so I was starting to be see that I was starting to be able to deal with these situations sober, that I didn't have to drink in order to be able to cope with life. And I was actually coping with it better than mm -hmm. I, I ever had before, even though it, he was the worst he had ever been. And he wound up getting sober when I was 14 months wow. sober. Oh, good. That's, yeah. a, that's a great story. You know, the old saying, bring the body, <laughs> the mind will follow, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this, I'm, I'm a retired police officer, 35 years. And for 28 years, I worked the streets and I was sober um, a few, few years and I'd go to meetings and I'd hear people from the podium talking about if I didn't know the cops in my town, <clears throat> I would have been here sooner. Every mm -hmm. time a cop stopped me, they'd give me a break because they knew me or my dad or my mom. And, you know, when I think back into the 80s when I was a young guy, all the people I stopped. Um, back then, we would drive people home. We would have taxis come get them. We, we wouldn't necessarily arrest anybody that was drunk unless there was a car accident, somebody was hurt or there was property damage. Other than that, you know, it, we would give people uh, an opportunity to, uh, you know, to go home in a taxi would keep the keys to their car at the station or whatever. Mm -hmm. Of course, none of that happens nowadays, but I, I like what you said about being able to you know, be <clears throat> responsible with that blower and that kept you, you know, you had no choice. You had, you had to stay sober. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing uh, that you mentioned here um, is that uh, KJ is that you never missed work. Um, that's crazy because that just throws us off. Like, hey, listen, I'm so responsible. I've never, I never missed work either. I could be hungover, um, you know, all that stuff, and and that I'm sure played a role in you staying out a little bit longer. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because a, another part of the story, I mean, I have a really long <laughs> story. It's been a lot of years. <laughs> so um, a part of that was that I attempted to get sober for five years prior to actually mm. getting sober. I had a, right after uh, my divorce, when I started to recognize that my drinking was getting out of hand, I entered into, I was exposed to AA for the first time ever. I never knew that AA existed. I never mm. knew. And it was the only, at that point in time, back then, 
it was like the only game in town, so to speak. You know what I mean? There weren't any other, at least that I was aware of. Yeah. But I thought it was wonderful. I had probably uh, a different reaction than a lot of people have to AA. I was like, this is the greatest <laughs> thing ever. Like there's this group this of people life, right? who are all dedicated to not drinking. And the foundation of the program <laughs> is honesty. Like that's fabulous. <laughs> well, little is. did I know. <laughs> right, up your, right up your alley. <laughs> yeah, right. But I was a little naive. Right. I was very naive yeah. going into it. That's so funny. the minute, the minute things sort of, you know, because it, it's people, right? And mm -hmm. there's all different types of people. And I hadn't experienced any consequences other than the internal consequences, mm -hmm. you know, of knowing that something was not right within me. And the minute I didn't like something that somebody asked me to do or somebody, you know, otherwise got me upset, I was out. I was like, mm. ah. You know, yeah, it's my way or the highway. Any, right. I didn't <laughs> yeah. have anything. I didn't have anything really anchoring me there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. just like the minute I, I was uncomfortable and I yeah. didn't like what was going on or something somebody mm -hmm. said, I was out. I was like, mm -hmm. I don't need to be here. Kind mm -hmm. of an attitude. Yeah. Yeah. KJ Foster, we're going to take a quick break here. But after when we come back from the breakup, we uh because we could probably spend three four hours on what you're what, what it was like right. <laughs> um right. now we want to we want to see what you know where where you're where you're going now um right. I, we really want to talk i know podfather and i were talking about your relapse prevention and trauma um that's something that really interests both of us is the relapse prevention that's such yeah. key um it's so great and then some meditation we'll talk about your meditation stuff so right. on the other side of the break we'll we'll get into all that and um podfather you want to uh take us to the break Absolutely. FriendsRecoveryPodcast.com. We'll be right back. You're first. First to respond. First to put others' lives before your own. And in an emergency, you need a network that puts you first, that connects you to technology, to each other, and to other agencies. Built with and for first responders. FirstNet, the only congressionally authorized wireless network for first responders because putting you first is our job. Since 1992, Genesis House has been helping real people heal from addiction on their private recovery campus in beautiful Palm Beach County, Florida. Their family-owned program is accredited by the Joint Commission and offers detox and dual diagnosis treatment in a comfortable and confidential setting. At Genesis House, they focus on treating the underlying causes of addiction. Their comprehensive approach includes psychiatric care, individual and small group therapy, trauma healing techniques, and holistic care including yoga, massage, and animal assisted therapy. After treatment, their clients enjoy the lifelong support of a nationwide network of Genesis House alumni. Call Genesis House today at 1-800-737-0933 to speak with someone who understands. Visit them on the web at www.genesishouse.net. It's time to start your journey to a long and successful recovery. Everybody, welcome back, Friends of Recovery Podcast.com. I am the Podfather, Mike Miles. And we're back from our break. Yes, we are. Podfather. Jersey Ed, do you have something? Jersey Ed. <laughs> <laughs> you figure after three years, we would probably figure out how to do this. Right. No, 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 not we. No, 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 not we. <laughs> I do my part. You <laughs> figure I wouldn't figure out how to do it. Well, just, well, not three years, Podfather, two years, because I had. Right. Because I didn't get my nickname until almost a year into the show. Right. You were Podfather right from the beginning. I picked it up right away. You I did. just liked it. Yeah. You did. Absolutely. Absolutely. But Podfather, speaking of shows. Talk to me. You know what time it is, Podfather. It's um, oh, it's <laughs> sober pod time. Yes. Sober pod time, baby. Right. We need music here. Like some I kind know. of. I got to get music. Right. <laughs> Horns. Bumpers, Carl. Ellen. Saxophones. <laughs> and Chelsea. Uh, sober pod guys over on the left coast and uh you know turn your dial to the right of course and make sure that you listen to sober pod and uh, those guys have really been supporting us um carl's a great guy uh carl's getting into some ac uh, aca stuff now um he's very open about it on his show um and he, they're bringing a new um kind of a new vibe to the show with aca stuff and the cool thing that they're doing, guys at Podfather and, and KJ, is that they're doing, um, it's called the tw other 23 hours. So 
Um, you know, we go to a meeting, we went to listen to a podcast, whatever it is, we're at a, you know, for an hour. And then what do we do with the rest of you know, the rest of the day, the other 23 hours? And, and they've been working shows around the other 23 hours, which is really cool. So, and Carl still curses and he still does his thing and, and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, but, uh, but listen to sober pod, you can find them on, they're not on uh, YouTube, but find them on any podcast catcher and, uh, give a listen. Great show. Tell them oh, friends good. of recovery sent you. Okay. Uh, KJ Foster, the founder and CEO of Foster Resilience, right? Resilience. Yeah, resilience. Yeah. I want to say resiliency <laughs> because it's like that's a buzzword now. Resiliency. So, <laughs> welcome back, KJ. Um, we were just going over some some of your past, and uh, you know, now we want to go over all the good stuff, which mm -hmm. that was some of the stuff that led you to the good stuff. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um Potfather, you had a question for her about uh about a few things right right um when ed read your bio earlier this afternoon we were talking um i, I love the part about i want to hear about the relapse um mm -hmm. portion I, I it's just so important because yeah. you know a lot of, a lot of therapists will tell their clients that relapse is part of recovery and you know i i don't i don't like putting that out there i mean it is frequent you know it frequently it happens but i don't think it should be part I don't think any of us want it to be part, especially mm. the loved ones or even the, even the uh, active alcoholic or addict. But unfortunately, it is part of it. But we always hope it's not. So take it away. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I like to talk about it with families because I work uh, a lot with families. I have from the very beginning of my career. And I do believe it's important for them to know because really when you think about addiction, a substance use disorder that's severe, like that's when we're really talking Certainly. about addiction. Yep. Um, it's a chronically relapsing disorder. So there's no if, ends or buts about it. Like generally speaking, Certainly. when we're attempting to recover, there there's going to be some relapses along the way that don't have to be full blown relapses, mm -hmm. but generally maybe maybe slips. So I, I like to make sure I prepare the family members for that because the way in which they respond to a relapse oh, can know. absolutely influence absolutely. whether that relapse continues or whether that individual is able to get back on track relatively quickly. So I think it's an important discussion absolutely. to have with family members um, and not disillusion them, you know, mm -hmm. to the extent of being like, oh, well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it won't have, don't, you know, if you just mm -hmm. like that, it, it doesn't have to happen, but in most cases, it's going it to be does. a part right. of the recovery yeah. process. That and we know that, we know that as therapists and we know yeah. that to beat around it. My point is um, for me personally, you know, 99% um, of, of especially drug addicted young men that I treat, they relapse. Mm -hmm. But right. I, but I don't, I don't. Um, until they, until they do relapse, I always right. tell them if you do, you know, you contact me. But I don't, I don't keep touching on it because right. I don't want that. You know how it is as an addict and alcoholic. We, we know yeah. that. Yeah. You know, we want to relapse. We, we want to break. Line. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they think yeah. there's a chance that, well, they understand. I'm going to relapse. I'll relapse mm -hmm. Saturday. You know. Right. So any any right. excuses yeah exactly yeah. but for the and, family it's an entirely yeah. different thing yeah it, it can really make a break somebody's mm -hmm. relationship as well right. you know? absolutely uh, but in terms go, go ahead no no go ahead i was just going to say in terms of my experience with relapse prevention i was very <clears throat> very fortunate uh to be exposed to a gentleman named terry gorski mm. very early in my career he just passed away oh um, no this, really this past year 2020 okay. yeah um but when i first started in the field which was i was just on shy of about two years and um i totally changed careers and at the time my husband was working at a treatment center as a therapist where he got sober which mm. is pretty cool. Yeah. And that's real cool. Yeah. And he introduced me to the owner of that treatment center. And I was able to start um, doing groups on spirituality. That's how I started. But then right away, the owner um, knew of my experience as someone who has family members, you know, my my experience with my ex husband, my experience with my son, and they immediately 
tapped me to working with the families. Right. And so I also was doing that from the very, almost the very beginning. I was mm. meeting with family members for during their family program. And um, and then I got introduced to Terry and Terry, I, I was lucky enough. He came into our facility wow. to, to train everyone in relapse prevention. And I was lucky enough to be able to be paired with him to conduct relapse prevention groups for our IOP program right. twice a week for two years. Mm. I trained with him and I just started to notice some things at that time <laughs> when I was doing it. I manualized his program for him Wow! Um, at that time. And I started to notice because I was learning at that at that same time, a lot of things happened like all at once. I was exposed to Brene Brown's work, mm -hmm. um, her TED talk about shame. Mm -hmm. And I started to apply that information to the clients that I was working with, the shame resilience. And I noticed in our relapse prevention groups that there were a lot of shame triggers that were being identified, but they, that we weren't really doing anything other than allowing them to talk about it to right. reduce that level of shame mm -hmm. and so i decided for my phd um, dissertation my research project that i wanted to incorporate shame resilience into the relapse prevention program wow. and i also wanted to uh incorporate even though we were doing meditations you know uh, here and there i wanted to incorporate it as a structured wow. process right. of the relapse prevention program so i combined terry's cbt exercises that i adapted somewhat with shame resilience and with mindfulness meditation mm. and as a result of that i did a research project and the the really interesting i could go on and on about that which i won't i'll just tell you the really interesting <laughs> part about it is that um, there's such a huge correlation between relapse risk. I measured relapse risk, psychological mm -hmm. well-being, and shame. Mm. And shame is directly correlated with relapse risk. As we were able to bring the shame down, relapse risk right. went down and psychological well-being went up. So that what I've sense. done- well, That makes right, a lot of sense. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I started to <laughs> notice that the individuals, which is why, how I sort of came about wanting to put this whole program together, I started to notice that the clients that I was working on shame resilience with were doing better with relapse in terms of relapse than other clients. So I was starting to just sort of notice this with the clients yeah. that I was working with. And what happened since then is that I've taken that program, that relapse prevention program, and I've applied it to my own fostering re resilience program. And I apply it to working with family members right. and family members. I have a family recovery workshop. And as a part of the workshop at the, the last component of the workshop is relapse prevention. And Usually in just about every family workshop I conduct, somebody will say to me, a family member will say, why do we need to be uh, doing a relapse prevention plan? Right, right. <laughs> right. Because you can relapse. <laughs> like yes, yeah. this is all about you changing your behaviors mm -hmm. and you looking at ways that you can change that are going to better support your loved ones so that they don't relapse. Because mm. when you relapse right. into old patterns, codependency, sure. old behaviors, then you're contributing to making it more difficult. Like clearly, I always emphasize, if your loved one picks up and they use, they drink, that's their responsibility, it's on them. But mm. you certainly can make it more difficult mm. on them without even often realizing that you're doing it. Right, mm. questioning them all the time. And yeah. you know, it right. makes so much sense. And what I, what I love what you're saying because it's a family disease. People do not understand. They wanna get their loved ones. I usually see people that are in the emergency room or they're, you know, they, they've been arrested. I get a lot of stuff from the courts, but 
the family usually doesn't understand. It's a family disease. Mm. Everybody's affected. It's just not the addict. It's not the alcoholic. Mm. Good stuff. I love yeah. hearing this. I stuff. can't, and I can't tell you guys how many times I heard my my son or daughter, you know, on the phone. My son or daughter needs help. You know, they they relapsed again, and I'm sick and tired of putting money into it, and I'm right. sick and tired of doing this, and I can't do it anymore. But how much does your treatment program cost? <laughs> you right. know, like right. like what, like when, you know, and I talk people off the shelf. Like, listen enough of spending money on on some of these p on some on your on your loved one let's put him into a treatment program that doesn't cost or it's going to run the state or whatever because it's time for you to heal too i mean is that kind of what you is that kind of what you get into also with the the family program uh, as far as that goes well, you know uh, sure i mean make him understand about, that piece anyways. Well, we talk about codependency boundaries enabling mm -hmm. um detachment yeah all of that yeah but i think one of the concepts that family members have a hard time kind of wrapping their heads around because there is a level of denial that's there mm -hmm. with the family members as well and there's shame that's mm -hmm. present mm -hmm. family members yes. having a loved one who's addicted so they're being impacted and influenced you know by that that experience of of shame mm -hmm. and and so what they have a hard time grasping sometimes is their own need for recovery mm. that they are you know because they don't want to hear there's already that level of guilt right mm. that that is there so um i know when i started going to al-anon and and i was told you know you didn't cause it you you can't control it you can't cure it i did not buy the you didn't cause it part i was like you know i know that i contributed to it like right. so um but you that's the me. main factor. You weren't the main factor. Before. Right. I wasn't the main factor, but yeah. definitely there were things that I was doing, like enabling yeah. that were yes. contributing to yeah. it. So I, I'm very much a uh, an advocate and a proponent, you know, a proponent for yeah. families getting their own um, help. I wish there were treatment centers that would pay like insurance companies would pay for mm -hmm. family members to be I able know. to go to treatment oh, because there yeah. would be the success rate would go through the roof. I mm -hmm. think if family so, members yeah. were able to get their own treatment. I know. Right. I agree with you. The yes, refuge, yes. Oh, the right, refuge sure. up north from you. Uh, I went to a great uh, codependency program in, in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, the, the bridge to recovery. Uh, oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, amazing, just amazing programs out there and they're all out of pocket that a lot of people no. can't afford. So expensive. In Tennessee, there's one too that's really popular. I'm trying to remember the name. Oh, of it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But, mm, shoot. Anyway. Anyway, I yeah. Know. <laughs> I know it too. I was there. Yeah, really, it, and but it's hugely expensive. Yeah. And so, all expensive. you know, the the people that really need it are the people that can't afford it, and right. and yet having something that they that they can i mean i offer a free family recovery training series on nice. youtube that's a video yep. series at least they can go on there right. and, and watch right. a series of videos that will help them because they really just need their own education right. they eat they need their own super they need right. all of the they need the three key factors in my opinion mm -hmm. that anyone needs in order to recover whether that's the individual themselves or the mm -hmm. family member they need somebody to educate them to mm -hmm. guide them through yep. the process to help them they need a, a support system that is going to help them through that process and they need they need and this is where pe I, people fall off the rails because they don't ex it, um, they don't understand it or they have biases relative to it is spirituality mm. and when i talk about spirituality it, i'm talking about mindset right. like you're just in this negative just like when we're in active addiction we are in this yeah, negative right. mindset right and what? and family members get in that despair right <sighs> that hopelessness that anger that resentment mm -hmm. and when we're living in that what i call the swamp mm -hmm. it, it's it's not Love only that. hurting us in, right. in, internally you know mental health physical health emotional health but it's contributing to our loved ones inability you know their their struggle as mm. well yeah right so, addiction addiction is a threefold disease mental physical spiritual nobody hears the spiritual part mm -mm. Right. If, the, if the government long before this epidemic or pandemic of uh, covert started we had an opioid epidemic right bar none one of the worst ever Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to look at it. Nobody cared unless it was their kids or their mm -hmm. loved ones. Mm -hmm. If the government could spend a tenth of the money for opiate 
addiction in people, family members, and addicts mm -hmm. as much as they've spent for this covert fiasco. I, I think we would have solved it. It's still going on. You know, people don't yeah. even want to look at it, but it's still going on. 81,000 people died last year of an overdose. That's that right. was just the ones that were, were, were kind of, um, you know, tracked. And that doesn't count the ones that, you know, died somewhere and they found or whatever, you know what I mean? And, and I think the um, ER visits went up 19% last year. Why the ER visits for the normal people for the colds dropped dramatically, like right. almost 90%. So, you know, the, the overdoses went up almost 19%. I right. was reading this article. So really sad. I know, yeah, it is sad. I know we have only a couple of minutes left here, but I do want to talk to you about your mindfulness meditation. That is so important because what yeah. you guys were just speaking about the spiritual piece of things, the spirituality, the understanding of who I am, my mindset, where I need to be to move forward in things, the positive mindset, I believe. I believe this is directly where it comes from. I meditate in the morning. I'm very mindful um, when I meditate. I'm very mindful about, about throughout my day. And um, that has just increased my recovery tenfold. It just shot it through the roof. And my everyday life also, um, not just me, my recovery life. So I really want to hear a little bit about that. I know we don't have much longer here. We all have to well, run. I'll, but I'll, I'll, Yeah, I'll try to adjust it really quickly. I can yeah, say that mindfulness meditation absolutely transformed my life. It, um, it, it is what really helped me to go from very low uh, emotional intelligence, so mm -hmm. to speak, emotional ability to handle and cope with um, emotions to being able to have that peace and serenity and be able to respond to situations without acting out in negative ways to hurt myself or others. And that, you know, we do that. You don't have to be struggling with a substance use disorder to do those things. I mean, people overeat, people over shop, people, you know, gam there, there's many different Everything. ways that we life. can respond. <laughs> yeah, right, life. 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 So I started to learn about the, the neurobiology of the brain and, and that really solidified it for me. It makes sense to me in terms of like, if you know about the prefrontal cortex and how mindfulness meditation helps to strengthen the Certainly. prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. which is what regulates the emotions and the intellect. That's so good. if I don't have a prefront, a strong prefrontal cortex, which mm -hmm. is weakened, by the way, through the process of drinking and drugging, if I don't have a strong prefrontal cortex, that means my emotions are blowing through and taking over and I'm just reacting. You know, right. I'm not able to really rationally think through what I'm doing, what I'm saying, you know, any of my on actions or behavior. Mm -hmm. And that ability to strengthen the prefrontal right. cortex and be able to pause and mm -hmm. sit and think through something before I act out in a way that's going to be detrimental to myself or somebody else that's... is huge. Mm -hmm. It's huge. So true. And, so true. And it, it, it's uh, to me, it's one of the essential skills. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really one of the things where when people enter into 12 step recovery or some other recovery program and they're physically sober, right. but they're not working right. on that. That's they're right. not meditating. Yeah. They're That's not right. working on that right. emotional piece. Mm -hmm. They're still miserable and angry sure. and yes. uh, reactionary. And, um, and you see them all the time, right? In meetings yeah. where somebody yeah. will say that they have 15, yeah. 20 years sober, and then right. they react in a way where you're like, wow, that's anxiety. Like, yeah. You know. One 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 question for you before we close about about meditation. Now, when I meditate every morning, ten minutes at least, in, uh, at least in the morning, um, my mind races and it keeps going and going and going. And what I realize is that it's okay for your mind to race. Just get out of the thought. Get back to the breathing. Get back yeah. to the now and here and now. But what it what it I realize what it did. Those thoughts are okay to come into my head because I'm not reacting on it. Like. Like this morning I was meditating. I'm like, oh, I got to go check this on the on my email. I got to do this on my, and I didn't do that. It's not like, okay, all right, I got to go check. I'm, I didn't do it. I sat there for another 10 minutes and then went away. I don't even know what the email was that I had to check. Right, so right. is that correct? How that works? Yeah. Is yeah. that what, See, what? One of the, one of the biggest misconceptions mm -hmm. about meditation, specifically mindfulness meditation is that the goal is to eliminate, right? To get rid of the, the thoughts and to not be 
thinking any to have this clear mind, mm-hmm. which first of all is an impossibility. <laughs> like we can't, you know, maybe you like if you're a monk and you've been like practicing <laughs> for years and years and years, you might be able to reach that state. But for the average person, right. and especially somebody who's in early recovery, like that's not going to happen. The to goal order, yeah. right. is to be a you know. That means when you're sitting there meditating and you're noticing that, that's right. like a magic moment of awareness. Like you're mm-hmm. having an awareness. My mind is racing. Like mm-hmm. I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking of that. The goal is to be able to sit with it yes. and experience right. it yes. and not have to react, react or, right. or right. just be able to sit and notice it and be with that feeling, whether it's a positive right. feeling, whether it's a negative feeling or whether it's just neutral. Super. Mm-hmm. And, and the more that you practice that, that you're able to just sit and, and, you know, I tell people that struggle with meditation, I'm like, don't even try to meditate. All I want you to do is just sit mm-hmm. for right. two minutes and just be silent, yes. like just sit and not, you know, be right. focused on your phone, like, you know, on right. your computer, wh- whatever it is. I just want you to sit and be with yourself. And that's mm-hmm. where they start. They just mm-hmm. start with this. Okay, let me just sit and mm-hmm. be present in mm-hmm. this moment. Yeah. And then AJ, there. you've been a great yeah. guest. Uh, hopefully we can do this again. This has been, um, I wish I had taken notes actually. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I've been taking notes. Pod, but I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be listening to the show because I am going to take notes. <laughs> Absolutely. You've been a great guest. Boy, yeah. I'll tell you, thank you've enlightened you. me so much. Yeah. Yeah, KJ, stuff. thank you so much. And and that, that last explanation about, um, uh, I always get asked, like, I, you know, I can't meditate. I don't know how you do it. I got right. these racing thoughts in my right. head and you know, I tr- you try to explain it, but nobody understands it until right. you yeah. do it. So thank you for that explanation. We right. really appreciate it. I would love to have you back i would love to have you back as going deeper into meditation mindfulness meditation um i think we should do a whole show on that so i'm going to get in touch with you and later on down the road we're going to get you back on here if that's okay yeah that would be great thank you so great, much for having great. me kj foster the founder and ceo of fostering Re- resilience is uh is was our guest today a wonderful guest pod father she was amazing was. Um, as I could just listen to her forever on all this, but um, you know, we do have a, a time frame here. So, but we'll get her back, Podfather. Your thoughts before we close? Anything, Podfather? Well, my microphone came on there. That's no. okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> a great guest. As usual, you know, you 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 find these guests that in um it's almost like uh, it's just amazing. Um we learned so much. I mean, I've been doing therapy for 21 years, I've been helping people in. Just uh, having a guest like this is just uh, more tools in the toolbox. You know what That's I mean? It. That's it. That's it. So, well, guys, and KJ, I'm going to put everything before we go, and, and we're, I'll have podcast Father close out. How can they reach you? How can you get a hold of you? And I'll put all that stuff in the show notes, and then we're done. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Do you want to, you know, you want oh, to tell you need us? Me to yeah. Say it? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let them know. Let them know. Oh, okay. So, my, my, um, my website is uh, www. Dr. KJ Foster, drkjfoster.org, or you can go to frprogram.com, Fostering Resilience, FR, or, and um, my YouTube channel is under uh, Dr. KJ Foster, Fostering Resilience. So Perfect. those are the different resources. Um, was there anything? Something well, we do post your meditation every Monday. I think it's every Monday. Stacy puts it on our on our Facebook pages. Well, well, so look for it there. Yeah. So I've now expanded my um, my posting. So every Monday, it's either a meditation or uh, some sort of other educational. Okay. A yeah. piece like right. uh, I think this Monday it's going to be on enabling. Okay. And I usually try to alternate like a meditation with a, a piece of educational information. And then on Thursdays, I post a meeting, an actual mm-hmm. meeting that is conducted for people who may, you know, three o'clock in the morning, there's no mm-hmm. meeting, they can go on and they can watch and listen, cool. meditate. Cool. attend the meeting Great. and then um on saturdays i post um now i'm doing music meditations mm. so just music because my husband is someone who doesn't a part of meditation is finding what works for you mm-hmm. and he loves music he he can only meditate with music so i thought that that might be helpful for nice. people to have music nice. good. meditation good. Good. good and of course check out the show notes and our right. our, our web uh, our uh, facebook pages and you get all this information on kj foster so podfather you want to take us out of here super yep friends recovery podcast.com stay, stay sober everybody, sober, everybody. <laughs> this concludes this episode of friends in recovery the addiction recovery podcast thanks to genesis house first net built with at&t 
for supporting those on the path to recovery and keeping this valuable resource free for all our friends in recovery. Follow us on Facebook for past shows and updates and enjoy free access to twice daily support meetings. Brought to you by Genesis House and the Friends in Recovery. If you can't get enough of Mike, the Podfather, Jersey Ed, and Skyler, you can catch them on Answering the Call, the First Responders Podcast. Available on Facebook, Podbean, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and GenesisHouse.net. <laughs>